Robotik in der Industrie. Der Podcast mit Helmut Schmidt und Robert Weber. Hallo liebe Zuhörerinnen und Zuhörer, willkommen zu einer neuen Folge des Podcastes Robotik in der Industrie. Mein Name ist Robert Weber, Helmut Schmidt ist noch nicht da, wir sind noch ein bisschen so im inoffiziellen Winterschlaf. Wir haben zwar schon eine neue Folge aufgenommen, aber heute wollen wir euch noch eine Folge aus dem letzten Jahr nicht vorenthalten, denn wir haben vor, ich weiß nicht, im Sommer über den neuen Festo Cobot gesprochen und da wurde so ein bisschen schon angerissen, naja, wir werden auch was im Bereich AI machen und der Peter Seeberg und meine Wenigkeit, wir haben ja noch einen Podcast zum Thema AI, also Industrial AI und wir haben mit Jan Seiler von Festo auch über die Robotik und die Zukunft der Robotik gesprochen und diese Folge präsentieren wir euch heute, ist in Englisch, sollte aber gar kein Problem für euch sein, wir wünschen viel Spaß beim Zuhören, wünschen euch noch ein gutes neues Jahr, ein gutes neues Robotikjahr und wir hören uns dann übernächste Woche wieder mit Helmut und mir und einem besonderen Gast. Bis dahin, bleibt gesund und viel Spaß jetzt mit Festo. Hallo Jan. Hi. Please introduce yourself in three sentences and please introduce Festo in three sentences. Okay, my name is Jan Seiler. I like to inspire people and see the spark of inspiration in people. I am the head of research for AI and controls at Festo. Festo is a company that is mainly known for automation technology. We are a family-owned company with around 20,000 people. Our headquarter is in Esslingen, close to Stuttgart. And we have, of course, sales offices all over the world. And within research and innovation, we are looking at the future of automation at the future of our products and the services that we can give to our customers and within this group i am responsible for the whole control team and our ai team which is focusing on on features for our products and for our customers peter when we started 2019 i think you remember we were at the Hannover Messe and you were talking to Jan Kautnick from Nascent at the Festo booth then. The topic was production organizing itself with reinforcement learning and we are also had a conversation with Zap Hochreiter who does something similar in a logistics center and today we can talk with Jan. What is the state of production at Festo, Jan? Well, we still think about these ideas. We We started a bit, we went back to the roots because just saying organizing production with reinforcement learning is, of course, a, a big idea and it has many facets. But the main ideas that are behind it, that we have our components, Festo has a big uh, catalog of components, around 30,000 components, and then give our customers the option to give us their their challenge, what they want to do with the products or what they want to produce. And us then giving them automatically a solution for what they want to do is, of course, still very valid. And um, yeah, we we took a step back and we uh, made this problem smaller into small sub-problems, which are, for one, programming a machine. If you already have a machine, you have to program it. It needs to have the tasks that it has to do. And the other one is building the machine itself. So there you can think of a layered approach. You have the inside layer, which is the programming of the machine, and then the outside layer, with, which is the building of the machine itself. And then we even think about building the components that then make up the machine. Yeah, I, uh, I recall exactly. I thought it was 2018, but probably 2019, as you say, an overfair. And I think it was maybe the first time that in talking to Jan Kautnick from Nasens and Jan had been working with a team together with you, maybe other colleagues, maybe you can talk about that. Jan, there's two Jans now, number one. And he explained at that time, after he had explained reinforcement learning, that yeah, in the future, with the help of reinforcement learning, are going to build. And then he was showing to, you know, machines that you were demonstrating there. And he said, you know, we're going to build these completely new from bottoms up with the help of reinforcement learning. So maybe, Jan, it, it would be useful. I think most of our listeners probably know, but maybe in, in your words, what is exactly reinforcement learning and how could it maybe help us to design products or machines? 
Sure. Reinforcement learning, very easily put, is learning with a reward. So you, you don't really learn from data itself, but you just tell the system what is good and maybe what is not good. And based on this, the system tries out a lot of solutions and then it gets rewards if it gets closer to a solution and it doesn't get rewards or it even get negative rewards um, if it goes away from the from the solution. And if you think about the engineering process on its own, it's, it's very similar. So we also have a goal where we want to go. We want to have a machine that, for example, manufactures something from... You have some um, ground materials, some basis materials and screws and tools and so on. And then you want to have a machine that uses these tools and uses these machines uh, to build a product, to manufacture a product. And then, of course, there are also steps in between. So you, you first have to maybe, let's say, put two parts together, screw them together. And then these two parts are a new subpart that you then manufacture to another part. And there you can already give rewards, right? So if you have um, an algorithm or have the PC do this, you actually know which direction you want to go because you know what is the end product. You know your final output. And this basis idea or this basic idea is very similar to to learning by rewards and it's also the only way that you actually could solve this because you don't really have a lot of data if you want to have a new machine there are of course mechanical principles basic mechanical principles that exist so there is a basic vocabulary of principles and components that already exists but typically you don't have the machine and you don't have data about the machine that you want to have because it's a new machine. Otherwise, you would just build an already existing machine or buy an already existing machine. Um, and that makes it actually very well suitable for reinforcement learning. Yeah, and it's, it's often, as you say, you know, learning by reward, it's, it's often compared to how humans raise children, right? If the child does something the parents like, it's being rewarded. Maybe you could share with us if there is, you know, one or two tips typical, you know, activities around reinforcement learning that maybe you have been impressed by in the last whatever years, months, that you say, okay, they were doing such and such, and we want to do something similar in automation, or we want to go a step further. I think that's what we're talking about as well. Yeah, sure. I mean, the, the big rise of reinforcement learning, I think, began with the solution of Go, the, this um, let's say, Chinese checkers game, which is much more complex than chess because you have a lot of possibilities uh, to solve the game. And a lot of people that were programming that made algorithms also that made, for example, chess computers said that um, this will never be solved. And then Google came along or companies that they bought, but they came along and they actually made an algorithm that could play Go. And what was fascinating about this is that when you played against these algorithms, if you ask players to play Go, they don't really know why they take a certain decision. They basically say it's intuition. It's like you played so much and you see the whole game then that you just play by intuition. And this is the biggest reason why people thought it would never, never be solved by a PC. And then people that played against this algorithm that was trained by looking at a lot of people playing Go and trying and learning, getting better and so on, like a human does actually, were very impressed by the strategies that it brought out because it were not the typical strategies that top of the world players had, but very unlikely strategies then surprised after like 10, 15 turns surprised the opponent. And that would uh, require a lot of foresight where each of the turns has like 10 to the power of 32 possible outcomes. So you cannot pre-calculate it. And this is where people, where the, ra the rise of reinforcement learning basically began. Then it went to other games. There were a lot of similar or easy Atari games where uh, reinforcement learning was used to control the game without knowing the rules. So you just gave it the game and say, play, and here's your reward. And then it got very, very well in all of them. So that was the start some years ago. And then the second path that is also very interesting, which came out of it, is actually doing this in reality, where you don't have a digital game or a digital environment that you control, but you have robots. Uh, and robots are sometimes very complex, especially if they have more than 
six degrees of freedom or if they have unforeseen environments. If you think of walking robots, for example, if they walk and everything is like has a well has a good friction, then that's very good. But if they all of a sudden step on ice, they have to react very quickly to not fall over. And I think everybody already saw these fail videos of robots trying to walk and stumbling and falling. But here, reinforcement learning made another push and made another step forward where we were able to build robots that react very naturally and very quickly to changing environments. And that was also the starting point for us. Uh, we also started with robots avoiding obstacles or robots interacting with humans and um, doing tasks and avoiding to hit the human, avoiding obstacles in their path dynamically and also with a um, dynamic environment, still being able to solve the task. And we still want to take this uh, some steps further. As I said, we want to be able to program the, the machines by its, on its own. This is very similar to this robot task, but there you already have the system. And now the next step is not having the robot, not knowing what the system is and what it can do, but building this out of existing automation components. Or as I said, even further ahead, maybe building the whole component. Let's come back to the robots. How do you set up conditions for this task? You mean the reward? Yeah. Yeah, it's it's very sparse, actually. <laughs> that, that is one of the challenges. So just because you move in a direction doesn't always mean that it's good because you could move into a singularity, for example, or you could, could move on a path that actually doesn't exist. So what you typically do is that you just make an end-to-end -end learning and the reward is reaching the goal or doing what you do. But that also means that you have to learn much more because you don't have this in-between steps. You don't know I'm getting better, but you just have a binary reward basically and you know that was good or it wasn't good. And then you typically, if you have a walking robot, for example, not just a a one-arm robot, but if you have a walking robot, you add another reward by um, moving forward. Right? So it's better if you continue to move forward or if you move forward in a certain speed. So there is actually a progress. But yeah, that, that is a bit of the difference. If you have some progress in, in the room and you, you want to move, then you can add this as a reward. But for a stationary robot that just has to solve a task it's even more sparse because you basically can just say you solved the task or you didn't solve the task and what is the status now with your project with this robot being able to recognize its environment because that's always the start right the, the robot has to understand what is in its environment what are objects what are static things that are just there what is a human and what is maybe a tool that the robot could use There, we are still using deep reinforcement learning also to make this map of the environment combined with classical deep learning for recognition and for segmentation, semantic segmentation of your environment. How difficult is it to get this, both worlds together? Because it's a totally different approach, I think. Yeah, yeah, it is. We are trying to mainly go for a skill-based approach. So... It's not the task of the reinforcement learning to make everything, but to solve one specific task. And then you have a skill in the end. You have a capability that you can use that you can plug together with other things. So you don't train everything at once. You train the skills and then you make like a skill ecosystem and put them all together. So you're still working on this robot solution and the next step is the programming, right? Yes. For the programming, we have some very promising results both with the robot programming the robot because our idea or we are convinced that if you really want to have a collaborative collaborative robot or robot that works together with a with the human it also has to kind of work intuitively for the human so the robot is easy to program and maybe not even needed to be programmed just put it there on your desk and it maybe gives you recommendations and says ah your desk is very cluttered should I clean it up for you? <laughs> and then you say yes, and then it knows what cleaning up actually means and what cluttered actually means. So there we have some really promising results. If we assume having this robot as a machine to build this so-called task graph where you have tasks and, and you can even move dynamically on the on the task graph. We are there working with NVIDIA um, with their Cortex framework, it's called, in, inside of Isaac. And there the results are really good. But also for our, let's say, more classical machines, we are having first results with a classical 
planning algorithms where you just say this is your initial state this is your goal state and then you're trying to find a path through a task craft that leads from the initial state to the goal state also there we we can already show that we can learn what a system should do but there is the challenge that um, we are doing this discretized so the system is like the workspace is divided into sections into specific sections And then you can just move to these coordinates, one, two, three, four, uh, in X direction, and let's say also four in, in the Y direction. And then you just have 16 places where you can, can go to. So it's simplified by a lot, but there the algorithm already works very well. But now the challenge is to go to a continuous task space where you basically can move continuously in all, all dimensions. And here also we see big promises in reinforcement learning. Peter? Uh, yeah, you already mentioned, Jan, so you're using existing planning systems. My question is, are they your systems? I mean, the same thing for, you know, the engineering systems we've been using for, I don't know, probably 50 years or something. Are those engineering planning systems being changed? You know, are they being updated to include, you know, reinforcement elements. Later on, we talk about, you know, generative models. Are you building those kind of tools yourselves or are you working with, you know, the providers of those systems? Mm, that's divided. We, for one, as fast to have our own engineering tools, which is kind of an IP for, for our, like, very specific solutions maybe. So there we are bringing these solutions into into play and into the usage of our customers but also we are also in bigger research projects for example or in collaborations with other companies where we try to in a bigger group tackle this this task and um, there we might also see the see the solutions coming to the market Jan, i want to come back to the interface you mentioned is it a voice interface or it is a vision interface what is the idea so the robot itself of course has a camera interface it has a, a rgbd camera which means it also has depth information about its environment uh, together with the rgb like the normal image information but we are also including other sensors and uh, fusioning them together so we have haptic sensors and we also have infrared sensors and over this we are actually laying a stochastic model that decides which sensor is the most safe because like you could imagine a robot having a camera but that, then the light being turned off around it then the camera is pretty useless so we have to have some stochastic overlay that says now switch to this sensor because this sensor is the best and what about the people who are working together with a with a robot are they satisfied with it does the robot gives task or sees task what to do or do you have tested that yeah we started to test there is actually pretty fascinating research about accepting robots and robot movements because robots don't move naturally by itself like they they move as you tell them so they can move very quickly and also very strangely for a human so there is a lot of research that went into this how should a robot actually move to be accepted in the comfort zone of a of another human and then the interaction is also very important and to our experience it's always then very successful if the robot actually helps and if you feel like you teach the robot something so if you have a very intuitive interface it might be your voice or gestures or just a touch screen and then you teach the robot little things and then you have like a success and you say ah, oh, I, i taught the robot to do this that's awesome and then it becomes a helper rather than a A foe <laughs> so you're not threatened by it but you mentioned that the robot tells the people oh your desk is very dirty we have to clean up that's the other side yeah that's true it, it, it wouldn't say you have to clean up it asks should i clean up for you <laughs> but uh, yeah still that's true of course we give we give ideas what might be the task so you don't have to start by zero if you want to program if the robot already knows basically what to do you can say okay yes i want to do a pick and place or i want to do a cleanup or i want to do uh, take something out of a tray and give it into my hand uh, application and then also all the robots that are connected to they they benefit from knowing that this is like one application 
I think, Peter, it sounds like an AI out of the box. The customer won't recognize the AI in the robot anymore. I don't know about the details of the robot that, that you're working on, Jan. So are, are they typically humanoid robots looking like humans? Or? Well, they are typical arm robots, like these six axes arm robots, but with very rounded edges. So they are actually collaborative, um, but not humanoid, no. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, yeah. I've I've never really understood why one would <laughs> do that, but uh, yeah. So I'm 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 with you there. I don't I don't see why you should, as a human, should have you know um, a piece of hardware software next to him or her, which um, which tries to look like a human. I at least as there's no added value to it, right? So yeah, I mean you 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 give them the arms, the the legs, the things that the robot needs. If you allow, I want to go one step back to where you talked about DeepMind, uh, AlphaGo, uh, then AlphaZero. And, and my understanding of it is that with AlphaZero, then it, the algorithm was not training, it was not looking at, for example, chess programs. Uh, and that's my point. My question is, if we're training algorithms, you know, specifically Uh, also the direction of, let's say, reinforcement learning, although there is not normal training, I believe, we will arrive at things that engineers have been developing in the last 10 years. Now, I would have thought, and then we come to the generative, I believe, is that what we would like is to say, you know, this is the end goal. End goal is whatever, you know, a cup of, cup of tea, cup of coffee, whatever it is. And you, algorithm in your environment through agents through robots you please find you know what is this thing that i give a a reward or a goal for is, is that idea correct that we should we can expect at some point in time algorithms to give us new designs completely new designs because we humans have just not been able to think of such a design Yeah, that's at least a possibility. I don't know if it will come that way, but I think if we don't give the robot the boundaries that maybe human imagination had or that like or the algorithm the boundaries that human imagination has, then it might find solutions that we wouldn't think of or it might find clever combinations of subparts that we would not think of. Of course, it will not redefine physics, so basic natural <laughs> laws will, will always apply, but um, it, it might still find solutions that are untypical or that we might not think of. And that's also why, why I think in this creative hypothesis phases of the engineering process, where you think of solutions, it might be a, a great help already. And then the rest of the process, the testing, and maybe going back to make a new hypothesis and so on. That can also be supported by AI, but I think this this hypothesis generation, what is a possible solution to my problem, there we have uh, huge potential. You're talking in your presentation about generative system design. I think that's the claim. How is that going to work? Well, let's see. I don't really know. Uh, it's a it's a research question. Okay. But the idea is exactly what Peter said before. We give a goal to a system, to an algorithm and say, build me a machine that does this or build me a solution for this. And then you have, as I said, different steps. You have maybe the first step is designing a new component because you don't have a fitting component to to build your machine and then you use existing components plus this component that you designed to build a machine and then you program that machine and then you have a solution or even multiple solutions within the context that was given that you can give to the person asking but you have to train this ai with the world model or the world model of a factory or a foundation model of a factory a big model of the factory that these ai knows what is to do how do you do that yeah that's exactly a challenge to to know how things work together <laughs> i think that's also why we we already have generative models for for static things so if you want to build a chassis or you want to build some some connectors you already can use models that basically try out the whole solution space and then give you the component that is lightest for example or or that is cheapest or whatever you can already do this but there you don't have that much interaction between different things and definitely not actuators that can move something 
maybe you have two or three more materials, but you don't have interaction. And that's that's really a challenge. How we are tackling it is putting a semantic underneath it, which uses a lot of uh, modeling uh, beforehand, of course. And the problem might be if the modeling is wrong, you cannot learn something correct. So maybe we have to move away from that. But at the moment, we have a knowledge graph that knows all the components and their geometric and electric and so abilities. And then you can infer from this what fits together. And if it fits together, what a new ability it gets if it is together. Because if you, for example, look at an axis, an axis by itself cannot do anything. It always needs a motor to move it or some kind of uh, energy source to move it. And uh, this you have to know. Otherwise, you would just take the axes because the axes has the ability to move linear. But you need to know that you need something that, that actually moves the axes and so on. I think that's very interesting because that sounds for me like you're working on a foundation model of a factory, Jan. Yeah, of a factory or of automation. Process. process. Yeah. yeah, processes, automation processes in general, yes. Because, Peter, we, we had a lot of discussion with our PLC guys and we always t told them, hey, you have to work on that because your PLC has so much data. They were not very happy about our, about our discussion. And now Jan tells us that Festo is working exactly on this topic, Peter. Yeah, what, what made me think, Jan, is that wh where you talk about, you know, bringing in a semantic model, you know, in times where we have been doing, you know, typically machine learning, supervised, unsupervised, these days reinforcement learning. But it kind of brings me back to the very beginning of, you know, the original meaning at that time, 1950s, 60s, when they talked about what is AI, McCarthy and saying, you know, it was very rules based, you know, build this system which can replicate intelligence. And that was called like the symbolic and that didn't really work out. And then we, we got to the machine learning. And you recall, Robert, that a couple of months ago, we had this talk with Sepp Hochreiter and Jürgen Schmidhuber. Jürgen said he, he never liked the idea of splitting the symbolic and the sub-symbolic world. Uh, Sepp is working on bringing them together. And I will come to my point. And it seems you're doing the same, uh, Jan, mm -hmm. question. Yeah. You work with reinforcement learning. We're moving into generative models. And at the same time, you combine it with a semantic model. So that is bringing kind of both sides of the capabilities of artificial intelligence together, right? Yeah, exactly. That's the idea. Because there is a, a lot of knowledge already existing. And why would you want to relearn it <laughs> when you have centuries or uh, thousands of years of experience that you could model? Where is this knowledge? It's in the experts' heads, sure. But how can you extract this knowledge for a model? That's the task of modeling engineers that ask intelligent questions and then they build the knowledge graph with its nodes and its connections between the nodes uh, by asking, how does this work? And then they need to formalize it, abstract it and build OWL knowledge graph out of it. And how difficult is it, what Peter mentioned, bringing the two worlds together and to handle these two worlds? Well, it's all artificial intelligence, right? So it's just two sub, sub areas of artificial intelligence to structure and organize research, I think. But in the application, in the end, of course, they can work together. Like a knowledge graph can be the basis for a planning algorithm, which can be the basis for an evolutionary algorithm, which can be the used within a reinforcement learning uh, algorithm. So I, I think you can always connect these worlds and i even think if you don't have a, a good basis that describes what your components can do then, then also also the learning would take either take forever because you have to try infinite amounts of options to put things together or it would not converge at all which from my experience is even more likely because you don't want to wait 15 years for it to train i think uh, robert maybe what you're asking for the uh, building this this world of a factory or a product or I don't know, whatever, but maybe that is the knowledge graph. So it is at least, or I assume that the knowledge graph will uh, include, you know, physics, you know, it's a representation of, of this world, which the algorithm has no clue about. So I could imagine that your reinforcement learning agents, that they somehow are busy in, in the world of a knowledge graph of, or relating to a knowledge graph. So you give them a task 
but you you tell it what the rules are like you know you tell alpha zero what the rules of chess are and then at the end it will find out uh, using the rules within the knowledge graph and then it will come up with at least solutions that are you know more or less realistic so it doesn't bring you one billion you know ideas which are not capable to be produced in our world but it gives you you know solutions that are realistic or very close to realistic question mark yeah exactly that's exactly correct because well it, it doesn't help to connect let's say a compressor that produces air to a electric axis and connect this to a football i don't know i mean <laughs> you, you, it, it somehow has to make sense to connect things together and then they that they actually can work together and, and be used together and these basic always true rules that are not like debatable or that were not ideas of humans but that are just there physics for example as i said why would you have an algorithm try out things that don't make sense right i do want to stay with this idea for a moment though so if we move maybe now into again generative um, design gans diffusion models whatever that's that's a complete new thing happening in this world which almost nobody has has seen i specifically haven't seen that coming so quickly now it's all about creativity so we certainly can see things which uh, although we give the algorithm you know text to image combinations so i think we talk about clip as well because there there is somehow realistic combination of you know what i see in the picture that is what i see now on one hand so people who who are designers so very creative people and also, you know, consumers like all of us are. Suddenly we, we see things, oh, I would have never thought that that would be possible. And then the engineer says, yes, it's not possible. But the point <laughs> is, so you can, you can have amazing ideas on one hand. And on the other hand, we need to then bring it down to the real world because in the end we want to be able to build it, of course. Yeah, that's the typical battle that architects and the people that build houses are fighting for years already, right? <laughs> But yeah, that, that's exactly that's exactly what what's happening. You can imagine a lot of things, and uh, then you have to test if it's actually true. So if you're going out of this hypothesis phase of engineering and go into testing, validating your idea if it actually works, it is better if you don't have a million different ideas and you already know by physics, by basic law, that they cannot work, and then you still test them anyhow, and then. You, the system tells you no they cannot work it is better to already have valid starting points have valid ideas to, at the beginning right so i understand that you are considering i don't know where you are there that you're considering you know including also like diffusion models i don't know if you're using a specific one stable diffusion dali or something else maybe you can talk about that a little bit maybe you can explain our listeners those that do not have the base understanding of how they work specifically and how you may then use them in your design process yeah we are thinking or evaluating these of course I'm, i've been thinking about this for one and a half years and i'm actually very happy that now they are getting so good that everybody starts to know these models like Midjourney or dolly or stable diffusion or any of those because i really see potential in giving a prompt which might be a problem solution, like a description of your problem to to a system and then the system finds you something that might work. Of course, it is still open if these models just rehash old ideas together, which they learned, or if they generalize so well that they uh, create completely new things. But the, the basic idea behind this, you train this model by having two models playing against each other. So it's from game theory and uh, one is the creator and one is basically the, the tester <laughs> let's say the, the other idea the names are different but to understand it more easily let's say we have a creator and a tester and the tester always gets two inputs it gets a real image that you drag from somewhere from the internet or from a database or whatever and it gets an image that the that the creator created and it has to distinguish which one is the real image and if it gets it right it, if it actually picks the, the real image it gets a point basically and if it gets it wrong the creator gets a point and you let these two algorithms um, or ai play against each other until the tester is not able to see a difference anymore so it's not able to distinguish 
between real and the created images. And then you throw the tester out, you fire it, <laughs> and you basically, you just say here, uh, the creator is now good enough to create to create things that are so close to reality that the tester couldn't distinguish them anymore. And then you have these, these models, these generative models. And typically what we see today is that the input is a prompt or another image, like there are different Im uh, inputs, but the most well-known, I think, is a prompt that you type. Um, let's say I want to have a panda bear on Mars, which is something that you wouldn't see in a, in a real image. And then you get images of panda bears on, on the Mars that uh, actually look very well. And you can also say which style you want it in and so on. So that's, that's what we are seeing uh, today, the models that we have today. Yeah, but that's easy. Let's let's switch to the machine building. <laughs> mm. Easy. Yeah, there, of course, are way more steps. You don't want to have an image. You want to have a 3D model or a functional simulation, actually. So uh, um, a working model of something that does something. So they're from where we are at the moment, which is already very impressive, but where we are at, at the moment where we get 2D images, there are still some steps to take. The first one would be not only having singular 2D models, but also have 3D models and also maybe having consistency. But I think we are getting there. We already have image text to video. So you create multiple images and they are not too far from each other. So you're not chaotically moving in the solution space, which was a problem of the very early models that if you change slightly the seed or uh, like the, the random seed as an input or you slightly change the input you could land in a completely different space of the solution space you it was very chaotic but now they are getting more stable so that that is the first step that you actually have more consistency in the output but of course there are what we already discussed before there are basic things that that have to be true. Like, how does something work? How does something move? How does movement in itself work? How does energy work? And all of this is not yet in the model. So they just create something and actually couldn't e exist. What I just said, a panda bear on Mars couldn't exist <laughs> because it couldn't breathe. But the model doesn't know that, right? And you have moving parts at FESTO too. Exactly. We also have moving parts. And that, that's why we are at the moment first looking at this hypothesis um, where you say very quickly, I get some ideas of a solution and then all of the engineering is still still done by people. But it could be an early step to, to try out different things. And, and also, if you think of things like the NVIDIA Canvas, where you can basically draw in a very doodly style, you draw things and then you get an image with different materials and so on. That's also something where we where we see potential. Very important different materials, yeah. Yeah, you, you refer to the architect. Now, I actually did study architecture at some point in time. And I do recall that is not the way it works anymore. I mean, I was one of the first to build, you know, the digital space around AutoCAD and other kind of systems, wireframe. But you know, the designer, it doesn't matter if it's an architect or if it's, a, you know, a colleague of yours, Jan, you know, sitting there and considering what it is that, you know, the component is going to look like. There's always a creative element. And we're going to see, I think, if these systems are going to be only coming up with things that are physically possible. So if they give, you know, like the text prompt, six, you know, examples, all six of them can be built physically. Or there is, I believe there is still always potential as well to, you know, look at these text prompts and see things, you know, like the elephant sitting in a tree. And we humans know, well, elephants don't sit in trees, but what does that do to our creative mind? So that is a thing and, and a relating, that's a remark question. I understand that these prompts are using typically something like, you know, clip models where, and that clip sounds very similar to, you know, models that understand the relationship between text and image. And that then sounds like your knowledge graph, right? You know, because your knowledge graph says, you know, the relationships between specific elements as well, right? Exactly. So we definitely would need to retrain and have a different database that, that is based in the physical world and what is existing. But that is at least a way that we want to try out. I don't know if it will work, but I see potential in it. And I think it is very interesting to explore. And then in the end, the, the next thing is going to be, I'm not sure you've been thinking about that, but we, we talked about, Robert and I, you know, the, the last time we did our news update, and I shared this idea that there is a, whatever, 
uh, a group of uh, artists, of designers um, who have been making imagery and putting it on the internet. And it could be that you no know, stable diffusion or other ones have been uh, scraping these images of the web. So they, they never, as far as I know, do reproduce an exact image as we just discussed. But there was this famous artist who died, and the same day there was this person who who then put up imagery, you know, in the atmosphere of this person who had just died. Now there is many, you know, the artists, designers, graphic artists who say, you know, I do not want to give my imagery for that purpose. And of course, this market is changing completely. Huge potential for your colleagues, Jan, you know, to design new things. But on the other hand, certain people will see their things changing. Now, the question also towards your direction, what does that do to original ideas, original ideas of you, of your colleagues, you know, sometimes they involve patents, makes it maybe easier. But what what does it do to ideas that come from you, your colleagues, and the next time, for some reason, you know, colleagues from other companies from competitors can use as well yeah yeah that's a very good question and also a very open discussion already in the current as you said in the art industry or in the designers industry also who owns this idea so right? this is the idea owned by the person who made the prompt or by the person who made the model or by the model itself or so this is like a very active also patent discussion and also actually to be able to fully train such a model you would need all the mechanical principles that already exist, but some people might not want to share it them and then you will not have all the solutions. So it has great potential for, let's say, an open source approach where we actually come together and, and use these ideas, but it also has the risk, I guess, from a business point of view that you would share ideas that you want to be yours and that could lead to everybody having their own thing or everybody learning their own knowledge base that they have in their their company might also be a way to go forward then you can still have your ip but you don't share it with anybody else yeah i I don't know where it will go i think it will will be a open discussion and also will be with us for the next years at least i would hope it's a very good uh, suggestion that the, the knowledge about uh, you know our physical world that over you know a long 100 200 well actually probably 500 years going back that we have developed as a society and building on each other's sh shoulders and somehow that knowledge is available i believe it's almost difficult to imagine that but that would be great if that would really be kind of put together in an open AI kind of whatever it's called, maybe people are working on it already, but that would be great if that only exists, whoever it is, you know, nobody is to own that, right? You know, it's like oxygen and the sun and that's, you know, they are representations of the world that, that should really be available to everybody. Let's come back to a little bit more reality, Peter, <laughs> not looking so much in the future. I want to ask Jan at the end, Is there a business model for these AI process models? You have the component, you have a digital twin of this component, and now you can also sell an AI model to your customer. Is it an idea of Festo? Yeah, there are different business models behind it. One, you could sell services for the component or for the digital component. You could make it as easy as possible for the customer. Well, if you want to have money for it or not, I would say no because it's just a benefit if you say if you buy with us it's easier for you but um, there are different different approaches what you could sell in the end uh, in a business case but i think the the most promising at, at the moment is in engineering tools because we don't have this whole chain yet we cannot build a whole machine or a whole component from scratch by ai unless it doesn't have movable parts and you very much make it simpler but in this engineering process and how you find your solution and also how you make it run right so you get your your system that you ordered and then it should in the best case already be programmed for you or you don't have to do anything or just very simple steps because that would enable automation for a lot more people not just for experts and not just within let's say the manufacturing industry or the bigger industry but you could think of 
service robots, uh, agriculture, you could think live tech, you could bring automation to a lot more fields and help a lot more people to, to do what they're actually good at, to interact with other humans or be creative and, and not use their time setting up a system that, that is poorly designed. Peter, last question to our guest. Oh, no, just uh, thinking further on what you just said, Jan, and also providing capabilities in our part of the world, at least, you know, where we're here in Germany, I'm sure other parts of Europe, other parts of the developed world, you know, we are we are lacking manpower everywhere. And it's, it's just becoming a real issue. My feeling is that until five years ago, when we talked about automation, it always had a negative social aspect. You always had to explain, yes, we're putting in a machine, we're putting in maybe a robot. Oh, yes, but everybody's going to keep their work or maybe not. I mean, that was always a, a big thing. And that has been changing in the last, I would say, half a year, year maybe. It's that people are looking towards because, you know, we're, going, we're not going to have the humans to do all the things that we want to do. And I think there's a, there's a huge potential. I want to say thank you to you, Jan. It's very interesting. We talk about, you know, being at your stand and over fair three or four years ago and in that time frame which at that time almost sounded not like a joke, but like, you know, Jan said, oh yeah, in the future, algorithm is going to do this. And, and I, we looked at him and said, oh, and today here we are, and you are actually developing exactly these systems. Um, very interesting. It was a pleasure, Jan. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. The pleasure was all mine. Robotik in der Industrie. Der Podcast mit Helmut Schmidt und Robert Weber.